Well, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alfonso Aguaron, and I'm pleased to be the moderator of today's webinar. I would like to welcome you all to this online session on IHA Highlights 2015. So, as part of Myeloma Patients Europe Educational Program, this session has the aim of informing patients, caregivers, patient advocates and patient organizations about the most recent myeloma findings and studies presented at the annual meeting of the European Hematology Association that took place in Vienna in June. Uh, the talk will be given by Dr. Katia Weisel from the Hematology and Oncology Department of Medicine at the University Hospital of Tübingen in Germany. And Dr. Weisel, on, on, on behalf of Myeloma Patients Europe, I, I would really like to thank you for your kind collaboration and, and for providing all the attendees with the latest information on, on this topic. Well, so for your, for your information, this webinar will be fully recorded and uploaded to the Myeloma Patients Europe website, which is www.mpeurope.org. So, uh, before we get started, I, I would like to make a small summary on the, on the webinar dynamics. So, as you know, uh, the webinar is scheduled from 5.30 to 7, uh, Central European time. So, in the first part, uh, Dr. Weisel will, will make a presentation which will last about 45 to 50 minutes. And then I, I will open a session for you to ask any questions that you may have. So, um, uh, there are two ways in which you can make questions to Dr. Weisel. Um, in the case you have a microphone in, in your device, in your computer, tablet, or, or, uh, or mobile phone, which is something that I strongly recommend you, you can press the raise hand icon that you are watching now on the screen, um, and then I'll mute you so you can make your question when it is your turn. There is another possibility. Uh, so you can do that in writing in the questions and answer window that you are now watching your screen. I'll get those questions and I'll read them to Dr. Weisel. But in any case, I really encourage you to make your questions using the, the microphone in order to, to have a more interactive session. So without further ado, Dr. Weisel, I will now share your screen and uh, I'll give you the floor to start with the webinar. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay. Dear Alfonso, um, dear all, it's a great pleasure and privilege to present the data to you, um, which we had heard at the EHA this year in Vienna a couple of days ago regarding multiple myeloma. And um, I would like to share with you uh, selected abstracts uh, which I thought that they might address your current interest. However, please feel free to also ask about other abstracts you might have seen or other rumors you might have heard. Um, so, okay. Just for a short introduction, um, it's not only a privilege speaking today to you about myeloma, it's in general a privilege uh, talking about this disease because in no other hematological disease we had this uh, tremendous improvement um, in prognosis and survival of the patients in the past decade. And we have uh, a bunch of uh, upcoming and emerging treatments um, which will allow us um, to continue on this process, which um, will not stop as long as we can now uh, look into the future. As you can see here, for the younger patients below 65 years of age, or under 60, or between 60 and 64 years, you see that the survival uh, continuously increases. We are now on the plaque curve. However, this was from 2006 to 2010. So we are now even five years um, uh, more forward. So we expect that this new curve will lie clearly up. But as you are very well aware of, uh, most myeloma patients are um, 70 years and older. And those patients um, did more late 
improve from the novel treatment because first the high dose malpalan treatment with the autologous stem cell transplantation was improved with induction and maintenance before the elderly patients um, could um, have advantage out of the novel drugs. But now it was clearly shown in more than 1,000 patients of the Mayo Clinic that also patients older than uh, 65 years of age have now tremendous improvement and overall survival due to the consequent use of novel agents also in a treatment of elderly patients. So with this, I would um, like to, in general, come back how we treat in the first line setting. And I uh, did this slide and all my other slides from a European perspective. You know that in the US, some treatment strategies are different, and they have different approvals for the um, for the different tracks. So this is a very European perspective I shall show you now. We divide patients if they are eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation, yes. In some European countries, patients below 65 years of age, in Germany, for example, 70 years, and in some countries, the age is open and it's just a biological um, decision. Or no. For um, autologous stem cell transplantation, we use induction, high dose malpalan, and then consolidation and maintenance is very differently used in the various countries and is mainly part of current clinical trials as there's no true approval for consolidation and maintenance drugs. However, I strongly encourage you and all the patients to participate in the current trials um, offered to the patients because they have really fantastic concepts around the high dose melphalan. I would now like to start with a presentation at the EHA regarding the majority of multiple myeloma patients, regarding the elderly patients not eligible for stem cell transplantation. For those patients, we had in Europe currently two, or up to this year, two standard treatments. Two treatments based still on melphalan and pregnizone in a low dose, either extended with bordesomib in the VMP regimen or extended with, uh, with thalidomide in the MPT regimen. And now, in February, the um, European Medical Agency approved lenalidomide and dexamethasone for first-line treatment. And um, there we again saw updated results of the approval trial I now want to share with you. The VMP regimen was based on the VISTA trial, clearly showed improvement of VMP versus malphalan prednisone. And also the MPT was approved because of a clear advantage in progression-free survival and overall survival compared to the old malphalan prednisone. Now we talk about the first trial. And Thierry Facon pre presented those data in Vienna. Updated overall survival data out of this trial, which established lenalidomide in combination with low-dose dexamethasone as one of the new standard treatments for transplant-ineligible myeloma patients as a first-line treatment. In this trial, um, lenalidomide low-dose dexamethasone was given in arm A continuously until disease progression or unacceptable toxicity. This was compared to arm B where the same regimen, lenalidomide and low-dose dexamethasone, 
was applicated for a limited time for 72 weeks, one and a half years, or 18 cycles. And this was compared to the at this time standard treatment established by the French study group who also which also conducted this large trial, Malphalan, Prednisone, and Thalidomide. As you see easily, it's a two-drug regimen compared to a three-drug regimen, and it's continuous treatment mainly compared to limited cycles of treatment. This was a really challenging trial. 1,623 patients participated in this trial all over the world. Main patient group was from Europe, from France, Italy, Germany, and Greece. Also here in Tübingen, we had a lot of patients participating in this trial. So, and those patients were randomized. And now, after um, close to four years, this analysis was done. And here you can see the overall survival uh, for the RD continuous arm, lenalidomide dexamethasone given continuously until disease progression, compared to the RD18 arm, the limited lenalidomide dexamethasone, and the melphalan prednisone thalidomide. It is not so clear in this curve because the RD18 arm is right in between. But there is a significant survival benefit for patients on RD continuous compared to methylan prednisone thalidomide. And uh, this was in the initial anal uh, analysis. And, and even more, in the updated analysis, it was even more clear, this overall survival benefit. Um, and this is what Professor Facon showed in Vienna. Oops, sorry. And this is the progression-free survival, so the time until uh, relapse occurs. And here you see that the curves run uh, quite a while, very parallel. But the continuous treatment then resulted in an advantage. This was initially shown, and again in the updated analysis, where the curves even more clearly separated here, and the P PFS for the RD continuous arm improved and is still significant um, compared in favor compared to the both other arms. What is more important, this is a bit a complex slide, but I would like to explain you this. We were talking about PFS2. PFS2 means how come patients out when we summarize first line and second line treatment. So the first two treatment strategies in treating myeloma. Why do we do that? It could be that probably one treatment uh, results in a resistance of myeloma cells, and then the patient um, have a benefit from the first, but not anymore from the second treatment. And so we look on this, but the PFS2 was also better in the lenalidomide dexamethasone continuous arm cell meaning that there's no disadvantage for the next treatment when the patients are coming out of this continuous treatment with lenalidomide dexamethasone. And this was um, uh, very important for us investigators to show this because this is the first really large patient group who was uh, treated continuously um, in first line setting. However, um, any treatment makes a toxicity. You very well know that. And um, what do we, uh, did we see on the lenalidomide dexamethasone continuous? We see neutropenia. 
We saw anemia, very rare thrombocytopenia here. This means below 50,000 platelets. However, it's always a problem with a treating myeloma, a relatively high rate of infections. So also in this um, immunomodulating treatment strategy, it's important to early use antibiotic intervention. And then important uh, side effects of lenalidomide, asthenia, fatigue, rash, and side effect of hyperglycemia. Um, uh, side effect of dexamethasone is the hyperglycemia. But um, importantly, there was no sign or not a real sign of um, peripheral sensory neuropathy, so uh, toxicity, which is common with bortezomib and thalidomide treatment strategies. And when all patients received a, a thromboembolic prophylaxis, there were only rare events of deep vein thrombosis on pulmonary embolism. With lenalidomide dexamethasone, we carefully looked on we, how we call it secondary primary malignancy, so other malignant diseases under or after treatment. And there was no sign that the continuous lenalidomide treatment enhances um, secondary malignancy. Um, uh, in contrast, um, the MPT arm had the highest rate of those three arms. So that Professor Facon came to his conclusion that this updated analysis showed clearly that the patients on lenalidomide dexamethasone as a first-line treatment had a benefit regarding time to relapse and also in the total survival and um, that this data um, get more and more mature. And uh, so that he said, this is a new standard of care for patients with newly diagnosed myeloma who are not eligible for stem cell transplantation. This was his um, conclusion. And uh, as the um, medication is now approved by the uh, EMA um, in all European countries, it will be uh, available um, soon for, for any myeloma patient in this situation. So I would like to come now to relapse disease. And here we come again back to lenalidomide dexamethasone because here it is since 2007 approved and very widely used, but now we saw data when lenalidomide is combined with a third agent, and those data showed really intriguing results. First, I would like to show you the presentation of Thanos Dimopoulos from Greece, who reported about combining carfilzomib to lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And carfilzomib as a so-called second generation proteasome inhibitor. But it is not comparable to bortezomib, neither in the mode of action, because it's an irreversible proteasome inhibitor and bortezomib is reversible, nor in its toxicity, which is completely different from the spectrum. Here in this trial, carfilzomib was combined to lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And the control arm was the standard treatment, lenalidomide dexamethasone. The so-called ASPIRE trial, um, with, where we saw the first data at the last ASH meeting. And this data were really, really um, great because they showed for the first time and so for unprecedented progression-free survival for patients with one prior treatment line before entering the KRD treatment with 29.6 months and even very high for patients who had already two or more prior treatment lines with 25.8 months. And even the RD arm was pretty well, but 
In fact, the KRDM was significantly better. And this was because the addition of carfilzomib to lenalidomide and dexamethasone leads to a tremendous improvement uh, in um, response. So um, patients showed close to 90% partial remissions under KRD. However, as I said to you before, no treatment without toxicity. We saw not really slightly more hematological toxicity in KRD compared to RD. But um, what we had to look on was non-hematologic toxicity because there is in a very few patient group a cardiac event under carfilzomib below 5%, but we all have to be aware of using carfilzomib in the clinical routine. So that here in this analysis, it was clearly shown again how much carfilzomib added to lenalidomide and dexamethasone improves the progression-free survival and the overall response. And even one-third of the patients in KRD arm had a complete remission. And so the authors concluded, um, sorry, that this is one of the new upcoming standards in relapse treatment of multiple myeloma. And to the best of my knowledge, carfilzomib will be approved end of the year in this combination in the European Union. So it will come very fast to our clinical reality. I show you also a trial um, adding something to lenalidomide dexamethasone in relapse. In this trial, it's called Eloquent 2. Elotuzumab was added to lenalidomide dexamethasone. Elotuzumab is the first monoclonal antibody against myeloma cells, uh, which entered uh, a phase three approval trial. And again, Tanos Dimopoulos presented in Vienna the data. Um, I skip this. Alotuzumab is a monoclonal antibody directed against a molecule called SLAMF7. And this SLAMF7 is expressed on natural killer cells, so the healthy immune system, and on myeloma cells. And this antibody, alotuzumab, binds again this um, marker on the cells and, and this is really intelligent, it activates the immune system of the patient, the healthy immune system, and it, it helps that this immune system recognizes the myeloma cell as a something to eradicate, and then the myeloma cell death occurs. And here is the eloquent trial, Elotuzumab, Landex versus Landex. It was the approval trial. And um, so it is important to note that many patients, this is a complex slide, but the only thing I want to show you is that many patients in this trial had a cytogenetic high-risk disease, as we call it, when the distinct cytogenetic markers, deletion 70P or translocation T414, are expressed on the um, myeloma cells. And also more than one-third of the patients were refractory um, to the last prior treatment, meaning they were progressing under the last treatment. 
And this uh, was what um, Professor Dimopoulos showed in Vienna, uh, that allotuzumab in combination with lenalidomide dexamethasone is superior to, to lenalidomide dexamethasone alone. The patients in the allotuzumab arm had a 30% reduction in the risk of disease progression or death. And so the median progression-free survival here of the allotuzumab arm was 19.4 months compared to 14.9 months of lenalidomide dexamethasone. So excellent data for addition of a monoclonal antibody. And here you see the patients um, achieving equal or more than a partial remission. And you see also here. Uh, the allotuzumab arm was superior, close to 80% partial remissions. However, relatively low rates of complete remission. However, we saw, despite that, very sustained responses under this treatment combination. Um, and you see that those patients achieving a complete remission, but also patients for the partial remission with allotuzumab here in light blue and light green, um, they have here a very sustained outcome. And this is regardless of age, younger patients and elderly patients had the same advantage. And this is regardless of the cytogenetic risk profile if the patients had the so-called high-risk myeloma disease. Um, and um, I skip that. And regarding adverse events, um, I can tell you also from my own um, experience with allotuzumab, it does not add toxicity to lenalidomide dexamethasone as a backbone. We had so many patients now on allotuzumab also here in Chile, and there's no significant adverse event. And what can happen with antibodies is that patients have an allergic reaction, especially in the first infusion. But again, with allotuzumab, that was not a problem. We have seen only very few infusion reactions, and they were all well manageable. So we have here addition of a drug, which has a very uh, 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 favorable toxicity profile. These are the infusion reactions. They were all very mild. Under 10% of patients had an infusion reaction. So that the authors came to the conclusion that elatuzumab is a, a real immuno-oncology treatment, a pure immunostimulatory a treatment, monoclonal antibody uh, acting via the natural killer cells. And this had very well data combining with lenalidomide dexamethasone. And I can tell you from my knowledge that also allotuzumab is expected to be available in Europe as an approved drug in 2016, so next year. You can combine allotuzumab with Lenalidomide, you can also combine it with bortezomib and dexamethasone. These data were presented by Andrei, Andrei Yakubowiak at the EHA meeting in Vienna. And this was a much smaller trial. So you see here like about 75, 77 patients in each arm. Bortezomib, dexamethasone compared to bortezomib, dexamethasone and allotuzumab. And um, those were well balanced between forage and, and prior lines. And um, you see here um, that the page, that also in this combination, uh, the allotuzumab um, combination was was better and resulted in a 28 percent reduction in the risk of progression and this in all analyzed subgroups. However, the median PFS days were inferior comparing with the lenalidomide dexamethasone combination with bortezomib 9.7 months 
compared to 6.9 months with bortezomib alone. However, you cannot really compare trials uh, with, each, uh, with each other. Here is the curve. You see when allotuzumab is combined to bortezomib dexamethasone in the light green curve, there's a superior outcome regarding time to relapse regarding progression principle. And this were accounted to all analyzed subgroups. Those patients had also um, a decent response rate. However, the response rate was not very much better when elotuzumab was added. Although it, it uh, came out to a better outcome to the, of the patients. And this is something we have to learn when we are acting with immuno-oncology treatments. So with the, um, those treatments targeting the immune system that despite um, a measurable myeloma disease, uh, an immunologic control uh, can allow a durable control of the disease. And these are the survival curves. They're really early presented here, but a trend in favor for the allotuzumab. Um, uh, again, here it's a much too busy slide, but I can summarize you that allotuzumab as the monoclonal antibody does not add toxicity to the backbone regimen with bortezomib and dexamethasone. And infusion reactions, again, mild. So um, Professor Jakubowiak said um, you can combine also very effectively the monoclonal antibody with bortezomib and dexamethasone. Um, and um, they, um, so that there is a, an alternative to combine this drug uh, when there is um, no possibility or no indication to give lenalidomide. Um, now I would like to share with you also the data of the ENDEAVOR trial. And the ENDEAVOR trial was mainly presented at the ASCO meeting. And although this is a webinar for ASH, I thought that I have to add those data uh, to make this, the, the picture I show you today more complete for you. I know it's, there's so many data and it's so complex, but I thought um, it, there would miss that we would miss something if we would not look on this data. So I come to a head-to-head -head comparison of carfilzomib. I showed you this before in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Now it's a head-to-head -head comparison of carfilzomib as an irreversible proteasome inhibitor in combination only with dexamethasone compared to its direct comparator to bortezomib as the first generation proteasome inhibitor, also combined with dexamethasone. So I think we, and I think you as patients, we would like to see much more often that we can look head to head what is better for me, what is better for our patient, is it the one or the other. And so patients here were randomized, more than 900 patients to either curfilzomib in combination with dexamethasone or bortezomib in combination with dexamethasone. Curfilzomib is already approved in the US, however not in Europe so far, as I told you, we expect that end of this year. Curfilzomib is administered in a bit difficult schedule or two days in a row every week and then after the third week, one week rest. Bortezomib, you might be very familiar with, uh, in a three-week um, cycle, day one, four, eight, eleven. However, I should say um, you that bortezomib in this trial was given unlimited 
So it was not restricted to eight cycles. It was only restricted to disease progression or toxicity. And in this head-to-head -head comparison, it was very clearly shown that carfilzomib was very much superior to bortezomib. Carfilzomib is the light blue curve and bortezomib the uh, light yellow curve. And so there was it nearly under carfilzomib the time to relapse, the progression free survival was nearly doubled. And so um, we all know that not everything new is better, but here it was clearly shown that the second generation protosome inhibitor in the head to head comparison in relapsed myeloma disease was better than the first generation. And this was also according to the response rate, looking here on the partial remissions. The partial remissions were much greater with um, bortezomib, uh, with carfilzomib in combination with dexamethasone compared to bortezomib. Even more, the deep remissions, when we have a reduction of more than 90% of the myeloma burden here in more than half of the patients, this under carfilzomib. And these are the overall survival data. Believe me, they are immature. We have to wait for a longer time, but there's a trend for, in favor of carfilzomib. Again, um, the toxicity has to be discussed. Um, there's a bit um, of oh, the hematologic toxicity is not very different. Um, there were slightly more infections in the carfilzomib arm, but it differs really much. Carfilzomib sometimes results into dyspnea. Here you see um, that it occurred much more than under bortezomib. Um, however, uh, constipation was much more often under bortezomib and peripheral neuropathy all gray had 27% of bortezomib patients, but only 9% of carfilzomib patients. Cuff was occurring much more often under carfilzomib than under bortezomib. Um, and so there is a more distinct spectrum of toxicity. Uh, the toxicity of those proteasome inhibitors cannot be compared. And again, there were a few events, cardiac events under carfilzomib, but the severe events were um, uh, low 5% of patients had a cardiac failure. Here again, the peripheral neuropathy, bortezomib, much more in favor, uh, occurred um, uh, there occurred much more uh, peripheral neuropathy events, and um, this was much uh, in favor for carfilzomib, where only 6% of the patients had equal or more than a grade 2. We say this when there is an affection of the activities of daily life, when the neuropathy affects activity of daily life. So in 32% of patients, um, this um, uh, this occurred under bortezomib, but only in 6% of the uh, carfilzomib. So uh, this head-to-head -head comparison clearly showed um, that uh, carfilzomib was superior to bortezomib. What that means for first-line treatment where, for example, all transplant eligible patients are received induction treatment with bortezomib and many patients receive VMP, as elderly patients in first line, what does that mean? Uh, do we have to change there also? Uh, we cannot answer this question so far. We have um, to look on the results of the uh, trials which are currently on the way. They will answer this question. We have to carefully look on and I think the data will come out very soon. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, so this was what I wanted to present you 
from EHA and the last abstract also from ASCO regarding multiple myeloma. And um, I hope this was not an overkill. It's difficult to explain this adequately. However, I'm sure you wanted also to hear some details and I'm very happy to answer now your questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Basel. I think it has been a very uh, sanded explanation, and for sure there has been some questions that came out out there. Before I start with the questions, uh, once again, I would, try, I would share my screen. Okay, so um, I just remember, the, so as you can see on the screen, there are two ways to make your questions. Some of you has already sent some of them, but remember that uh, all of them just send it by writing. So if you would like to uh, <clears throat> to do your question live, please place the raise hand icon here. And if you prefer to send it by writing, as some of you already did, just send it to me and I will read it to the to the uh, to Dr. Uh, Weisel. So, well, I, I'm going to start uh, with the questions that I have received. So, the first of all, um, it's, oh, sorry, just a question, just a minute, please. Yeah, seems like I'm having a little problem with my computer. No, okay. So the first question says, uh, comes from one of our attendees and says, thank you very much, Dr. Weissel. It's been a, a great summary. And he said that uh, he attended the IHA meeting, but uh, but he hadn't had the chance to go through the poster session. And so he asked, I know you were presenting there a review of newly diagnosed myeloma patients who were not eligible for transplant. Uh, so could you give us an overview on this? And once again, she says thanks for your for your presentation. Oh, thank you for the question. You uh, you mean uh, the post that I presented at the poster session? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, what we looked um, on uh, was uh, uh, um, treatment comparison between lenalidomide, dexamethasone, continuous treatment, and VMP, and as you um, are aware of, there is no trial comparing those, and there will be not, no, no trial comparing those, but there is always the question, how would that study look like if you would compare not NPT with RD, but VMP? So the only thing what you can do is to make a meta-analysis and comparing um, trials um, with each other. And this is, we did a so-called network analysis. It was very, very complicated. Um, and with the MPT in between and uh, leading us to this uh, comparison. And um, it is always, we should always be very careful to, to um, uh, to uh, interpret, interpret the results, but um, what we saw is that the two drug combination with LAN DAX um, was in all analysis we conducted not inferior to the three drug combination bortezomib, marfa, LAN DAX, and um, in fact it turned out in this uh, meta-analysis that it was uh, slightly superior regarding progression free and also overall survival. I would interpret that very conservative, um, but uh, what I thought uh, we can clearly uh, take out of this, um, there is no sign that this two drug combination is inferior. Um, in contrast, we have signs that uh, it is absolutely comparable so that we have really alternatives and um, in this meta-analysis, RD was uh, slightly even superior. Good. So it seems we have uh, some experts, expert patients of the audience, tending to these meetings, and I think this is uh, very good news to see it's time more patients and patient advocates in this kind of congress. So. Um, the next question um, that I receive uh, says like that. 
So it says, recently, Datatumumab received a fast track uh, from FDA after the results that were presented from phase one, two. Even results look promising. It seems that it will take time to have it available in Europe. So uh, the, the, this attendee asks if you could give a comment on, on this track. Even you have mentioned it in your slides, but if you can give a comment on this track. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I took the Dara Tumumab slides again out because I thought like, then it's an overflow. But thank you very much for this <laughs> important question. Yes, deratumumab, the monoclonal antibody directed against the CD38 molecule, um, showed in phase one and two trials very promising single agent activity uh, and also very promising results in combination treatment. Um, and um, as you know, the FDA. Uh, is acting totally different from the European Medical Agency, whereas uh, the FDA allows approval according to phase, three, uh, phase two data. Uh, the EMA uh, restricts approval to a randomized uh, compar comparing phase three trials. But um, those trials, they are uh, called for as uh, relapse treatment um, like the stars, like Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux trials uh, were already conducted. Um, the uh, Pollux trial compared daratumumab um, in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone uh, to lenalidomide and dexamethasone, again, one of those uh, comparing trials. And the, um, this um, uh, trial closed very fast. The accrual was very uh, quick. Uh, so it closed um, with a full, uh, uh, full recruitment uh, early this year, so we can expect uh, results, I think, uh, next year, 2016, on the meetings. And the Castor trial, that currently the last patients going in, we, for example, today uh, included also, again, one patient. This is Daratumumab in combination with bortezomib dexamethasone compared to bortezomib dexamethasone. And they expect the um, end of accrual now, end of July. So I think uh, we can expect the first phase three data um, next year. However, from the uh, publication of phase three data and a bit mature data to the approval, it will take time. So I think. Um, this might take us, I don't know what the company has ideas, but I think two years we have to expect until an email approval. But I know that the company works on um, a single patient use program that probably patients can have access also in Europe before the official approval on a, on a um, single patient use program or compassionate use program. So um, there, there is work done on that uh, to get uh, access to daratumumab before the official approval by the EMA, uh, which will take a bit more time than uh, now uh, for allotuzumab. Okay, thank you for, for your response. I think it was very clear. So our next Next question next question says, uh, do you think that linalidomide and pomalidomide will replace thalidomide in the near future as a first line standard of treatment in combination with other agents? Um, I think that linalidomide will re oh, kind of replace thalidomide um, in the first line setting, um, yes, um, due to its more favorable uh, toxicity profile and also due to the um, higher um, uh, immunomodulatory effect that a little mite has. Um, I uh, don't think that pomalidomide will do because, um, as we know so far, um, pomalidomide works very well after linalidomide, but it seems that it does not go the other way around. So I think the approval of pomalidomide will be restricted to patients 
who had already lenalidomide before and this will not allow um, to bring the drug in the first line setting. However, it might be possible for selected patient groups or we have to wait um, uh, about new data um, coming out, but so far uh, I think um, it's turning a bit more out like I told you now the scenario. Good, thank you Dr. Weichel. So next question says, uh, will dexamethasone be removed from the current treatment standards in the near future? And the patient says, well, as a patient, it's hard to deal with its side effects. I'm not sure if all these new drugs coming on will replace it at any point. Uh, thank you for this important remark. Um, we all prescribe dexamethasone, and uh, we don't have to take it. And um, I, I. Uh, really um, know that this is one of the most toxic drugs we have in myeloma treatment. Um, however, I think currently we cannot get rid of it um, because it's still a very important partner. Uh, we know, for example, that pomalidomide has only half the activity without dexamethasone. We know that lenalidomide has much less activity without dexamethasone. We know that carbozomib has more activity with dexamethasone. Um, but what we need to learn, I think, from the investigator's perspective and from the physician's perspective is if we can go down from the dose and the interval that we have, I think we have to continuously work on coming down uh, from this, uh, from the high cumulative doses, we did already make clear progresses. When you think back to always this four-day courses we had in myeloma treatment, now it's more one day or two days with half the dose. So we came down from the dose, but I think there's more work to do, um, and we should take this uh, very serious to to continuously work on. Um, but currently, I think we cannot replace it really so far. I, I, um, I don't see there a very good solution currently, but I think we should keep that topic always very high on our discussion, uh, uh, in our discussion. Okay, that was a very clear answer. Uh, I just want to remind because uh, all the attendees, because I still have some questions that you have sent, like six more questions, but uh, I'm very amazed because the number of attendees for this webinar is very, very high. I think we, we have set up a new record on the on the attendance, so don't be shy, and uh, if, if you want to do these questions on your own, just remember to press this button and I will unmute your microphone. And also, you still have some questions to send. Don't don't hesitate to do it. So our next question is also related with the with the one that you have just answered. is related with quality of life, and it says like uh, uh, even myeloma is still considered an incurable disease. Thanks to new agents, we are able to see patients who are living longer, almost chronifying the disease in some cases. So, uh, looking all these studies that you have presented, my question is. Uh, will quality of life markers become a primary endpoint uh, uh, apart from overall and progression free survival? Um, I think um, as a primary endpoint, it's uh, so far um, it will not come in the near future. Um, however, it's gaining more and more importance, and I think this is uh, uh, it is important, and we need to further work on. As a primary endpoint, it's very complicated because it's so difficult to measure. You know all the standardized questionnaires our patients answer in this clinical trial, but um, when you see them, working with them, um, they sometimes think, oh my god, what, what do I answer? It does not fit really uh, to my situation, and so, and some questions are a bit weak. Uh, so as long as we don't have um, a real better m measurement, however, this is so difficult to establish that, 
I think as a primary endpoint, it will not very well qualify, but it, it is gaining importance as a standard secondary endpoint now in all phase three trials as gaining importance in the discussion of approval of a drug. Um, there the, the uh, authorities look on this endpoint and I think with more and more data of, out of this large trials, we even learn how to make the assessment better and um, uh, so um, I think we, we learned much more to look on quality of life, um, but we have there uh, to continue uh, our work on and uh, to fo continuously focus on. Okay, thank you for that answer. We have any, uh, another question from one of the attendees uh, related with carfilzomib. So the question says, uh, looking at the good results of carfilzomib trials, do you think it will replace bortezomib as a standard of treatment in the upcoming months or years, or it is more likely to have a bortezomib generic drug and keep carfilzomib for only relapse and refractory myeloma? A very good question, a question we all, all I think, think about. I can only <laughs> speculate, and it's um, a very personal view. Um, I think from the data I see coming, it might uh, be a replacement there in first line or first relapse uh, of carbozomib. Uh, compared to bortezomib. However, um, carfilzomib um, is, uh, we have to also look on, on comorbidities and patients yeah, who might not tolerate it. However, it's very, very well tolerated and the toxicity data in the, in the trials were very encouraging. Uh, and it will be probably more uh, an economic question also when carfilzomib becomes generic. Uh, what will happen then? Um, what is the matter of cost? And then we come to this very complicated discussion, uh, what is worth uh, uh, PFS and everything. And I think this uh, we have to very be very careful discussing such points. Um, from the from the efficacy and objective point, I would say that I see carbozomib um, uh, or the development in first line and early relapse or, or, or the first to third relapse treatment. I see uh, carbozomib improvement. Okay, so we we see it seems that we'll have to wait a little bit more and see what what happens for us finally. Okay, so uh, next question. There are three more questions. It is um, well, the, this patient says I I read in the Myeloma Patients Europe website that the EMA has recommended the approval of panovinostaz. Uh, I read it has a new mechanism of action, but not so. Sure what does this mean? So could you please explain more on this? Yes, um, a panovinostat uh, will be approved very soon in combination with bortezomib and dexamethasone. Panovinostat is a so-called HDAC inhibitor. So it's how we say an epigenetic treatment. What's, what is this? Um, this means that it's um, not directly affecting the, the DNA, it's affecting the um, the mode the DNA is folded, um, so it's it's another level of um, interacting with the cell. Um, and there are very uh, famous epigenetic treatments uh, and successful in treatment of myelodysplastic syndromes. You probably heard from. Um, as a cytidine or called vid aza or decitabine called um, uh, dacogen um, um, uh, in the treatment of myelodysplasia. So it's um, again a very distinct mode of action um, of what we call epigenetic, so beyond the classical 
um, interaction with the um, uh, DNA coding gene. Okay, <clears throat> so let's see. There is another question who says, uh, I see lots of new treatments uh, that will be probably coming out soon. Uh, these are great news. Uh, however, I'm a little bit concerned that they haven't been that they haven't been tested in the real world yet. So are the drugs safe enough with the data thrown in the trial results? Um, I'm sorry, there was a, a helicopter landing here in the hospital. <laughs> okay, so, I, no, I, 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 I did I really understand the um, how this um, new drugs will uh, turn out from toxicity when um, outside clinical trials? Yeah, that's it. Uh, if, they are, if they will be safe, safe enough in the real world, yeah. in the clinical world, yeah. Yeah, and um, it's always a question we ask also because we know that um, patients participating in clinical trials are often highly selected, especially in the early phases, phase one, phase two. However, in phase three, I think then with uh, like of close to 1,000 patients treated or so, we are close to um, the real world, but we are not in there, and it's right. Um, we always learn much more when the drugs are then applied to the whole myeloma patient group, and this is the reason I, for myself, think um, the work does not end with the approval. It starts with the approval um, with one drug, and we have to carefully continue to work on those drugs after approval. Uh, for elotuzumab, I think we will not have any surprise to expect uh, in the real life. Uh, this is an antibody. I think we we will we don't have to expect any uh, uh, toxicities. We haven't seen uh, for carfilzomab. I think we have to see um, how patients with probably more comorbidities or elderly or old patients or more fragile patients will tolerate the drug. Um, um, but I also saw here that um, for in elderly patients, even old patients in the trial, um, in patients with comorbidities, there were very encouraging results. Um, and for um, um, there are tumor map. Um, I think we have still to wait. This is too early. We have to wait for the phase three results in a, a large patient um, group. Um, and for panovinostat, um, I think we learned from the uh, panorama trial that panovinostat really enhances the bordism of toxicity, especially regarding diarrhea and fatigue. And one has to see how this will be manageable in daily life. Um, but uh, there were intensive work done on managing these toxicities, and I think um, it's always then also a matter of getting used to um, also by the treating physicians that you gain uh, experience with the drugs. And so I think if there's a chance. Um, to receive one of those novel drugs in a center uh, which potentially has uh, participated in those approval trials, uh, then, the, um, then there's much more experience there and, and probably also uh, there, if there is a distinct situation with comorbidities, um, you can probably, ex you can expect there is experience and um, so we can probably help uh, to uh, to make this step in the real life uh, smooth, um, but I think they are all um, they will all be established very soon in the daily myeloma treatment. Good. Well, uh, we have another question. I would say that this is also coming from uh, real world again, and is related to access. Uh, at this point, I would like to to mention that from myeloma patients Europe, we are currently working on a to develop a European atlas on access to treatment, I, and I think this question, it's, it's something that we're trying also to address and, and to solve this problem. So the question says like that, Dr. 
Dear Dr. Weisel, thank you so much for your great presentation. I am the relative of a patient living in Romania and we are still having problems to access to access drugs such as talum, 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 uh, sorry, talomite. <laughs> Talo Ah, whatever. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Tell them I don't know what you mean. Not to say other approved drugs. So my guess is this new. So my guess is these new upcoming drugs will be quite expensive. So do you think there is an effort out there to improve access to those drugs in countries like mine? And if not, how do you think this can be solved? Ta ta lo eh, sorry, and I'm not sure what happened to me now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I I know that um. Uh, that there is a, a huge difference between the approval state uh, ar across Europe and also if the EMA approves how long it takes until a, a drug is then launched in the country. And in Germany, we have the advantage that it's, it normally happens quite fast. And, and um, uh, but uh, I know that there's a wide spectrum. Um, so. Unfortunately, I, I think I cannot really sufficiently answer your question because um, I'm not in a, an authority and not dealing with these approvals. Um, uh, I can only um, say that we um, investigators of our countries, we always try to do uh, any effort to, to support approval uh, and um, and uh, giving our expertise to the authorities and offering our expertise that um, questions are solved and that um, um, uh, that um, approvals can be translated into to, to daily life. Um, uh, but um, it's a, at, at the end, it's a it's a political um, thing if that happens and how that happens and especially with this expensive novel drugs and for sure they will be all expensive again and I think um, we can only um, uh, a strength uh, uh, working on a strong network we are, we are kind of all sitting in one boat and um, only if we, we work very close together we can reach our goals and I think we can only try to, to very um, establish very strong and, and well-functioning networks to, um, to help um, to solve those political um, decisions and to, to support um, the decisions uh, that they are patient-friendly. Good, thank you very much. Yeah, I think this is something in which all, all of us, we have to work together and in which patient advocates have probably a lot to, to do and to collaborate to to uh, grant access to patients to the new, grad, new, new drugs. I was meaning, by the way, talidomite, I'm sorry, but I, I'm mean, currently in Madrid and there is like 42 degrees outside, so I think my <laughs> my brains are a little bit dizzy right now, so uh, sorry about that. So our last question comes from Antindi and uh, he says, uh, from my understanding, I see it takes years of research to have a new drug for myeloma that it is proved to be efficient in the treatment of, of the disease. So do you think is there a way to speed up this process now that the medical community has a better understanding of myeloma? Uh, and he stated that for patients, the, t the time is a real issue. Yes. Um, also, very good question. Um, that we have also always to outweigh um, uh, the, the unmet and urgent need for novel drugs and uh, for quick improvement. Uh, or to, to get the patient access to the novel drugs to improve the, um, the survival, the, the time living with myeloma. And we have to outweigh this um, uh, with um, a careful development and a, a patient safety, that, this, that, all, that the drug is really safe. Uh, that we can we we do not harm patients with a new drug uh, that probably uh, causes uh, resistance or or some unexpected toxicity that you can not have another drug after this drug or some scenarios you can imagine 
so that has to be carefully outweighed. And um, I think um, also here we can um, only um, intensify our networking. And when you're looking on Zara tumor map, this is an example that a drug really came very, very fast from phase one in phase three. Um, uh, and um, I think we have to work on, and we do that already, that also in phase one, when we want to see a dose, uh, and uh, that we answer questions on efficacy uh, and what's going on uh, with the myeloma cells. We, uh, we intensively answer also in this early trial phase uh, um, scientific questions. And, um, and uh, we, as academic institutions, we, we, can, uh, we can help to answer those questions even in early uh, phase trials, and I think um, more networking and addressing uh, broad questions in early phases is um, very important. And then to always carefully look on um, on speed and all, but also on safety. And um, and when we there bring our expertise together um, from all the sides, we have to look on the drug. Um, I think we can um, make it to speed up processes um, and uh, so uh, help our patients to get earlier access to those developments. That is good. Well, that was the last question, but I would like, I know it's a very general question that I want to do, but well, just keeping in mind some of our last webinars, like uh, the one we had in January on the US 2014 highlights, highlights with uh, Dr. Swigman and Dr. Van der Donk from, from Amsterdam, and also a webinar that we have like two months ago on smoldering myeloma, uh, which was given by Dr. Hillengas and, and Dr. Mateos. Um, it seems that there are new things that were presented at the EHA, and I know it is a very difficult question to answer, but uh, do you think, uh, Dr. Weisel, that we are in the way to um, Let's say, well, I'm not sure if to find a cure, but at least to chronify uh, myeloma. Do you think we are in the right way now and that patients can expect to have uh, real good news in, in, the coming, in the coming years? Yes, indeed. I think we are on a very important point currently. I think in, in first-line treatment, we are now very intensively discussing about minimal residual disease and eradication of minimal residual disease. And we, um, so I think um, for a, with the novel treatment strategies and bringing all these developments together, um, we are now at a point that we can induce with frontline treatments, combining those treatment regimens, can now induce in a group of patients um, long-term remissions, um, patients not relapsing then after a decade or so. And, uh, and I think um, this will be a step over the, the point minimal residual disease negativity. It will be a challenge for the patients. We have to learn. We have to take much more often bone marrow, like in leukemia patients and so on. But I think minimal residual disease negativity will be a goal of first-line treatment, especially in transplant-eligible patients. And I think that those new trials designed with this as an endpoint will lead to a significant proportion of long-term remission. In contra uh, or in uh, for, for the further di disease course, I think that the novel treatment strategies, especially those, um, those immunomodulating strategies, the immuno-oncology uh, strategies, and then carefully combined probably to new proteasome inhibitors, that they um, can um, make or can achieve the goal of disease chronification. And now it's the great challenge to figure out which patient needs what. And 
which patient needs very much and which patient needs more immunology and which patient needs more cytostatic um, approaches. And, um, uh, and when we there carefully look on the trials and carefully listen to each other, I think we, we are um, with the multiple myeloma, well, we are at the point now in 2015 where we stand there and have it um, now for the first time kind of in our hands um, to, to, to uh, give a, at least a significant proportion of patients uh, the, the, the vision um, that they can um, live a long and, and sufficient time with the disease in a chronic form or even um, without a, a detection in a minimal residual disease negativity. And I think we can um, look um, there um, optimistically forward, but it, it will be a lot, a lot of work uh, to figure that out. And we have to be very, very carefully and we have to um, very carefully listen to each other. But I think we, we, there is the chance and we will make it, yes. <laughs> I think this is a, a, a good, a very good message to to end up with this session. I think uh, we we have taken lots of things out of 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 what we have been talking today. And, uh, and so, Dr. Beisel, once again, and, and on behalf of of my Aroma Patients Europe, I'd like to to thank you for for sharing with us your your valuable time. So, well, I think it's been a very fruitful evening, uh, knowing more about, about the very latest updates on uh, on the field of multiple myeloma that were presented in Vienna last month. And uh, I would also like to say thanks to, to all of you who joined us during this evening. And just to remember, uh, this webinar will be, um, the, the recording of, the, of this webinar will be uploaded shortly in the Myeloma Patients Europe website. So, without any further ado, I encourage you to stay connected with us and follow our upcoming activities in our website. Remember, it's www.mpeurope.org and also in our Facebook page. And uh, we also strongly recommend you to check our member section uh, so you can contact your local myeloma organization just in case you haven't done it yet. So uh, we are looking forward to meet you soon in our next webinar. And once again, thank you for very much for trusting Myeloma Patients Europe. I wish you all a, a very good sunny <laughs> evening and, uh, well, goodbye. And, and thank you once again, Dr. Weissel. Thank you. And I wish you all the best. And thank you for listening to um, the session and I am really happy to answer also questions via email um, if there is uh, something I can help you with. Thank you.